sometimes we, we want to just do everything at once, right? But the real, reality is that that's almost never practical, right? Bus restaurant owners are already busy enough, right? If you try to throw everything at once, it, it's not really going to end well. So we try to start with the very basics um, and, and start building on that. Welcome back to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm a huge believer in systems, and one of the most important foundational systems is understanding your critical numbers in your restaurant, your finances. And, you know, a lot of restaurants are busy running their restaurants, but they're not running a business. They're working in their business, not on their business. So today's guest is Jonathan, and he's from Mora CFO. He specializes in working one on one with clients to really figure out what are the pain points and the challenges keeping them up at night from a financial standpoint and how to put some basic systems in place that really increase the bottom line and move the needle. He started out with a restaurant history. His dad has owned restaurants now for 30 years, uh, went to college to study finance, worked in corporate for Burger King, had the huge chain perspective, and now he adds all that expertise to smaller businesses and restaurants specifically. So you're going to want to check out this episode and stay tuned. Thanks to our sponsors this week, and thanks to you, audience, for once again tuning in. Here we go. You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. People go to restaurants for lots of reasons. For fun, celebration, for family, for lifestyle. What the customer doesn't know is the thousands of details it takes to run a great restaurant. This is a high-risk, high-fail business. It's hard to find great staff. Costs are rising and profits are disappearing. It's a treacherous road and smart operators need a professional guide. I'm Roger. I've started many highly successful, high-profit restaurants that I've now sold for millions of dollars. I'm passionate about helping other owners and managers not just succeed, but knock it out of the park. I created a game-changing system, and it's filled with everything I've learned in over 20 years running super profitable, super fun restaurants. Everything from creating high-profit menu items and cost controls, to staff training where your team serve and sell, to marketing hooks, money-maximizing tips, and efficiencies across your operation. What does this mean to you? More money to invest in your restaurant, to hire a management team, time freedom, and peace of mind. You don't just want to run a restaurant. You want to dominate your competition and create a lasting legacy. Join the Academy and I'll show you how it's done. Let me introduce you to GoTab. GoTab is a restaurant commerce platform with a suite of solutions, including POS, online ordering, mobile pay, and even a kitchen management tool. Now, you know I'm all about maximizing sales, but did you know that operators using the GoTab platform see 35 to 50% higher check averages and 20% higher tips? Now, that can be a real game changer for your bottom line. The GoTab platform empowers you, the operator, to run a leaner and more profitable operation. Listen to what GoTab customers have to say. Kent says with real-time analytics, we can manage our plate costs. When we switched to GoTab, we were able to lower labor costs and increase wages. Ian shares that our chefs and managers love to use GoTab. The back end is well thought out, intuitive, and easy to use. While Keem adds that the GoTab team is always available for us and extremely responsive. GoTab's flexible, easy-to-use solutions will simplify your operations, putting you in control of your restaurant's success. Visit GoTab.com slash Rockstars today to sign up for a free demo and get qualified to receive a complimentary meal. Again, that's GoTab.com slash Rockstars. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. I'm so excited you're here. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm well, thank you so much. You and I are, are kindred spirits in many ways because this conversation is going to be all around restaurant finances. And, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, I was totally obsessed with that in my business. And I think it's so important. So thank you for being here. You've got a lot to share. But my audience always knows that I start with the backstory of my guest. And yours is particularly fascinating. So please take us there and don't leave anything out. I think it's a great story. Sure. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for the invite. Um, so I guess the background from the beginning, right? So uh, I was born in Boston. Um, my parents are Brazilian immigrants. So they moved to Boston a year before I was born. 
Um, and my dad has been in the restaurant industry basically since he moved to Boston. Um, so he's probably been in, you know, a little over 30 years now. Um, and he started out, you know, uh, we always lived around Boston, like, uh, you know, a couple of miles outside of the city, but my dad always worked in Boston many, many years in Fenya Hall, almost, uh, 30 years. If, I, if anyone's familiar with Boston, you've probably been to Fenya Hall. I was there a couple of weeks um, ago. Yeah. I mean, the whole food court idea taken to the next level, you walk through those buildings and the choices are endless. So yeah, I keep going. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my dad, uh, moved to Boston, um, you know, early nineties. Um, you know, started working in Fenya Hall, spoke no English whatsoever, um, but learned English, you know, working in, in the city and started out as a dishwasher in, uh, in, in Fenya Hall, uh, it was one of the restaurants he spent the most time in and worked there for a couple of years. Uh, I spent when I, between when I was around six or seven and eight or nine, he bought his first restaurant. Uh, it was a couple of miles out of the city. Uh, actually, it didn't didn't work out. I think he, I think it lasted a year, um, and and they had to close shop. After that, he worked in a couple of other things. Um, I would say maybe two years. Uh, tried out real estate investing, and then after he was able to to, to get some money, uh, bought. The restaurant bought his first restaurant back in Finney Hall, which is actually a smoothie shop. Uh, it's still there. It's in it's in a different spot than it was before, but it's called uh, the Monkey Bar. Um, so it's a smoothie shop, and I remember growing up basically in in Fenya Hall. Like since I was very little, uh, I worked in that smoothie shop. You know, learned to make smoothies and that kind of thing when I was like ten. My dad would spend give me like twenty bucks for like two hours, two or three hours. I'd be there. So I always grew up in that, in that, in that environment. And, um, so yeah, so that was my dad's first shop and he, over the next 10 years, um, uh, did switch, you know, he, he would sell, sell that one and buy a different one. He worked in, he had experience in a couple of different shops, a couple of different restaurants there. Um, but for the most part, I would say for about 20 years, he was an owner of that exact restaurant that he started as a dishwasher in. Uh, so I like to tell that story because that's great. You know, it's, it's that classic American, you know, opportunity for sure. uh, story. So yeah. awesome. So that's what I grew up in. Um, and, and I, uh, we actually moved back to Brazil for a couple of years when I was 15. Um, I finished high school there and then my whole family moved back to Boston. I went to school. I went to Boston college. So I was, you know, I'm Boston through and through. Wow. Um, That's amazing to go back to Brazil where your roots are and spend a few years and then come back to Boston. I mean, these are major, major shifts in, in life and lifestyle. Um, do you have a particular, let me, I, I don't mean to interrupt your story and you're going to continue, but do you have a particular affinity for Brazil? Do you go back there now? I mean, it's obviously part of your heritage, your culture, all that kind of thing, but Boston is your home. So how yeah. do you feel about that? Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I grew up in every summer I would go, go to Brazil, spend you know, like a month there. Um, I have a lot of family there. I have grandparents, I have cousins. So every summer I would go spend a month, uh, or more. And yeah, I mean, I'm very, very connected to Brazil. Um, it, it, if you're, if you've been in Boston a while, you probably know that there's a huge community of Brazilians in, in around Boston. Um, it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest Brazilian community outside of Brazil in the world. Oh, I, I had no idea. I mean, we know of the Irish, we know of the Italians, right? I mean, there's definitely a mix of, of different cultures and nationalities, but I was not aware there was a big Brazilian community in Boston. Yeah, it's really big. Huh. Um, actually, yeah. my dad now, he's, he's the owner of a Brazilian steakhouse, which opened last year. So. Okay. My dad's been been had a, in a different couple of different concepts, um, but but yeah, I'm very connected. In fact, my wife is from Brazil. Like I met her when I was in high school in Brazil. Um, so I mean, we speak Portuguese at home was the first language I learned, and I've always been connected to that community. I mean, till to this day, um, uh, I I I would say I connect with most uh, with Brazilians most of the time. 
So you're in Chestnut Hill at Boston College. What a beautiful location and campus that is. Very close to Boston, of course, but out sort of in the suburbs. I mean, Chestnut Hill is a beautiful community. So tell us about your experience there. I mean, did you, you studied finance at Boston College? Yeah. Um, so it's funny. that's a funny story in itself. Um, before I went to Boston College, like, as I said, I finished high school in Brazil. But I was in this tiny town in Brazil that is where my dad grew up. And I was the only kid in my school, in the school that was applying to college outside of Brazil. So, and on top of that, I was, uh, it was, I was going to be the first generation to go to college. So like, I knew that's what I wanted to do. My parents were on board and, but I had to do it all on my own. Like I knew I had no guidance counselor. I knew nothing about the process. Fortunately, we already had the internet, so I went through the whole process online. Mm -hmm. But I applied to a couple of schools not knowing anything about it. And you know, it, was, it ended up being between Boston College and Boston University. And then when I went to visit, I just fell in love with the campus, right? It's that beautiful campus in Chestnut Hill. And I, you know, I decided, to, you know, this is the place. Yeah, because BU and has this big spread out down, you know, city campus, right? And the buildings are all over the place and it's a completely different experience. Whereas, you know, you're in this community in Boston College. I mean, yeah, beautiful. Both both are very, very good schools, but there is there is a difference. And obviously that was the right place for you to be. Yeah. So so yeah, I went there, I studied finance. Um uh -huh. when I went when I when I went through the process, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Obviously, like most kids. Um, but I fell in love with the business school, uh, studied finance. And I had this funny uh, idea that when I went to college, since I was the first generation to go to college, I, I thought that I was going to come out of there like this finance whiz and, and be able to like uh, help my dad in the family business and, you know, just like take that expertise and knowledge and just go with it. I realized, you know, two years in that I probably wasn't going to come out of school that big of an expert as I thought, and that I should probably get some experience in like, you know, real world, real world experience. So in the middle of college, I started to look for internships, right? And I was a, I was a bit late already, but um, I, I was lucky enough to connect with, with a colleague who was two years older than me, who had had joined the management trainee program at Burger King, uh, the Burger King headquarters in Miami. And through a, you know, a mutual friend, he connected me and said, you know, I think this, you know, might be a good fit for you. So I connected with him. His name is Vinny. And he was, you just joined, said, no, man, you got to join. It's perfect. And the funny thing was that a couple of years before Burger King had been bought by 3G Capital, right? Which is a, big private equity firm that is controlled by Brazilians. So oh. there were a lot of Brazilians in the, in the firm, and, you know, including my, my buddy Vinny. So I was like, man, this is perfect. perfect. Like, yeah. uh, you know, there are Brazilians there. It's, it's, you know, restaurants. Um, I get to live in Miami. So I, I went through that process and I was able to get a, you know, get a, a job at, at Burger King. And that was my first uh, job out of school. Let me ask you something. This is really great. Um, did you know that you wanted to pursue restaurants and hospitality as a career? I mean, finance can take you in every direction in any industry across the globe. You could have gone anywhere, done anything, and you chose restaurants. Did you? Is it based on your experience growing up? And you said you worked in the restaurants. Your dad owned restaurants for 25 years at that time. And it's like you had to have a passion for this business to say, yep, I'm going to I'm going to stay this course. And then you met Vinny and then the Brazilian connection and Burger King and Miami. I mean, all those things, all the pieces came together for you. But I think it starts with passion. And, you know, would you say that you definitely had that and you knew you wanted to pursue that path or you just fell into that path? And no, you know, absolutely. You, you know, absolutely. I, I, I mean, before I went to college, I already had this idea of like I, I admired my dad a lot right? Like his journey and his story. And right. I thought, you know, I want to build on top of that. Right. And, and I thought that going to college, I would, I, I was always a numbers nerd, right? I always liked the math and, and that kind of thing. So I thought I would be able to add on to what my dad had built and, and kind of, you know, grow the family business. That was my goal. I realized in college that, you know, I needed some more, right? There was, when I, when I got to college, I realized how many opportunities there were 
I said, it would be a waste for me not to take advantage of this. And then I started to explore the different routes, right? A lot of people were going into investment banking or consulting or something like that. Correct. You know, and I looked at those things. Um, I, I think it was just a really great coincidence because when the opportunity showed up, was I thought like, you know, this is perfect for me. Like I have this background. This is in an industry I'm already, I already have, you know, a passion about. I, I get to be connected with the same kind of, kind of community. And, you know, I, I had to, to be honest, I had to persist, persist to get the job. I, I, I think I went through the process like six months and kept getting, it was funny. I was going through the interview process and people were saying, you're a good fit, but not for this role. And they would sh- send my resume around until I finally found a department that, that, you know, said, you know, you can come here. And, um, well, they didn't want to let you go either. Right. But they had to find the perfect fit, but it took some time. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Wow. And, and you stayed the course there too, because most people would have said, you know what, I got to, I got to get moving. I got to plant myself somewhere. I can't wait months for you to make a decision, either hire me or I'm gone. Right. But you stayed the course. Yeah, exactly. All right. So you learn, you got a full immersion then in what it takes because chain restaurants obviously have every single system dialed and finances are no exception. I mean, I often, and I use this as an analogy, but it's like right down to the cost of the paper that covers a soda straw. They know how much it costs to put a soda straw in a cup, you know, all those things to the nth degree, which obviously independents don't have the restaurants that dialed, but that's that's what you were, you know, fully versed in and you were there for several years. So tell us about that experience and what you actually learned that you can apply to restaurants now as a fractional CFO. And then we're going to dive into what that means. Yeah. So, so it was a fantastic experience for multiple reasons. Um, w- one of the things that was great was I got exposure to different departments. So when I started, even though I had done a finance degree, the role that they found me for was an analyst within HR and and, a, and the funny thing was that I got a, I made a good connection with the, the VP of, of HR and he wanted me on his team, but it was for a project where I, I, I got a company car and I had to visit all of the corporate restaurants and do like an audit of them to see how they were doing within this uh, program they were calling the excellence program which was really systems to the nth degree where the the VP of company ops was figuring out how to measure everything in the restaurant, you know, from people to how they, you know, organize their ops to everything and try to have like a really good program that he could pay out bonus based on and help people and help promote people based on. And my role was to kind of go out in the restaurants and kind of help score them because they needed some way to be physically in there. So that first year I was, you know, driving all around Miami, visiting all the restaurants, meeting the people, talking to the GMs. And that was a really cool experience. And at the same time, I was based in the headquarters, right? So even though I was in the headquarters and most people didn't really go out to the field that much, I was in the field all day. Um, but I was at the same time learning about all of these systems and all the departments and how they worked, um, how they thought about budgeting, you know, the level of control that they have in, in terms of the numbers and you know, relationships with, with suppliers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that was kind of my first year. And then I finally got the opportunity that I wanted originally was to work in finance, right? And then I started working with the stuff that I thought was really interesting, which was uh, the budgeting, um, doing forecasting, you know, th- they want to understand what, if they're going to get, be able to make bonus, right. In, in the corporate settings at the end of the day, what the people were most worried about is, are we going to make bonus this year? Right. So looking at, looking at all the numbers in detail and, and how, how we're doing against our budget. Um, and that was a lot of what I did for, for like three years was, working on forecasts, on budgets, on you know, strategic plans. Um, and in addition to Burger King, I also worked on the Tim Hortons brand, right? Which is within the same parent company. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that was just an amazing experience because I was looking at it. I was able to see like, to be in the restaurants, connect with the people, see what that was like and compare that to my experience with my dad. 
right? Because that was a very corporate structure. I was very, very different from a you know mom and pop restaurant. Um, and then I was able to go to the other level where I was working on materials that would go to the board, right? That would go to the CEO, the reporting and, and the budget, and we had to get their approval. And um, so I was able to see a lot of different things and learn some skill sets that went that I could apply back to the to the to my parents, right? In, in a different way, but the principles are the same. It, it doesn't really change that much. I think they're foundational principles. And once you understand those basics, then you can make a big difference in the bottom line of your business. And you're right, whether you're a huge corporate chain or you're single mom and pop, it's like these fundamentals are, are profit drivers. We're talking cost controls. Like you need that system, but I'll let you keep going. I totally agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I think what the biggest learning for me was, and now it's kind of second nature to me, but the way that these kind of finance guys think, right, it it can it can get sophisticated, right? But at the end of the day, it's actually really simple. Like a lot of the decision making, a lot of the thought process was really very basic math. It was all about logic. Like, like if we do this, what is what is the implication of that, right? And doing that math. It was about understanding what the implications of our decisions were going to be and, you know, looking out and seeing if that was in alignment with what our goals were. And if not, you just adjust and, and you iterate until you find what's going to work and what's going to get you where you need to go. So let's talk about what you do now. You're a fractional CFO. So first of all, tell us, well, why don't we, why don't we define CFO versus controller in a business. Um, let me give you an example. So I ran restaurants for 23 years and I had multiple concepts and I had a solid understanding of finances, but I worked with not a fractional CFO, but not on a retainer basis, but we had a really great relationship with a CPA who was also a controller. And he worked with small business to help them dial in their finances. But for us, we were constantly doing new capital improvement projects or taking on buying another restaurant. And this person would really, you know, cut through the clutter. They weren't as close to a project as I was, and they could give us an objective viewpoint toward a decision and run numbers and crunch this and that and and really help us make solid decisions. So I think there's an element of that in what you do, but let's first of all define what those terms mean and then let's talk about what you do and what your approach is to helping small business and restaurants specifically implement these financial systems and make better decisions and improve their bottom line. Sure. So CFO, most people know it means chief financial officer, right? Um, I, the way that I explain it generally uh, for people who aren't that familiar with what's the difference between a, you know, your CFO and your CPA or controller is, and I always go back to my Burger King, uh, experience, right? Um, at Burger King, you had the CEO and then you had the C-suite, right? You had the, the chief financial officer, the chief marketing officer, et cetera. The chief financial officer under the chief financial officer is the are a lot of different responsibilities, right? You have investor relations, which is dealing with investors, dealing with the markets. Um, you have FP&A, which was the area that I spent the most time in, you know, financial planning and analysis, which is helping with the budgeting and the forecasting and the intelligence, right? Um, but you also have the chief accounting officer, right, who handles all of you know, keeping the records uh, straight, making sure that the accounting is is in is in good order. Um, you had a tax team, right? There was a there was a tax you know a chief tax officer as well under the CFO, who would uh, you know that was a team in itself that all they really did was try to figure out the best way to reduce taxes for the company, right? To keep that tax rate as low as possible within um, within the the rules. And so, the, but the CFO, he dives into each area, but at the end of the day, what his role is taking the vision that's coming from the CEO, right? The CEO has somewhere that he wants to go and helping to map that out and, and figure out what the roadmap is there and what, what the finance, you know, needs are there to get there. 
right? The CFO is that person who's translating the vision into numbers, basically. And, and then we'll kind of quarterback with the different, with the team, right? We'll lead. And sometimes he'll be focused more on the, on the budgeting side. Sometimes he'll be focused more on the accounting side. It, it depends, but he's, he's coordinating all of that. And the end goal is just to help to support the CEO to getting where he wants to go. Gotcha. All right. So let's talk about what you do. Now you're a fractional CFO, which means you work with many clients and you assist them in all things financial. But we talked a little bit about budgeting and forecasting, and we're going to talk about cash flow. But can you walk us through the process? Let's just say I'm a new client and I've got one restaurant or three restaurants or whatever, doesn't matter. And I need these financial systems. How do you analyze someone's business to decide where to begin and what they need first and prioritize things? Or is your approach always the same? You come in with sort of a template and we're going to work on A, B, C, D, and E. And then when, and then when we are all set, then you're going to be in a much better position. How do you work with clients? Well, we, we generally, uh, when we start working with clients, we generally know that it's probably going to go a similar path but every, every client situation is very different. So we always start out with you know, a call or a couple calls to really understand the situation of that client. So it, you know, I, was, I was talking to, uh, to someone last week, you know, in a, front, you know, a potential client, right? And he said, look, I need to meet with you. And, and, and basically I was, I was probing all of the questions of where his financial pain points are, right? Like what, what's keeping him up at night. And for this specific client, he, he was saying, you know, the business is not doing very well this year. Um, my cash is X and I don't feel really comfortable making decisions because I feel like I can't see what's, you know, what's next, right? I'm, I'm afraid to make an investment. I'm afraid to make, make a change because I don't know what my position is. My financial position is. And we started probing and he had done really well last year and, and started doing some problem solving, right? Like what, how did you get here? What are the pain points you have now? And, and in that meeting, you know, I was talking to him for two hours. We, we kind of got to the bottom of how he got to the situation he's in, uh, financial, like what, what are the decisions he needs to make in order to get to his goals, right? I spent that time also understanding first what are your goals, right? What, what is your core business? What is, the, what is the most important thing you do? What's your story? That has to inform everything that we do, right? And then understand what, where are your pain points right now? And generally, right, it's going to have something involved with organization, right? They don't, they don't, they don't have their books organized or they, they can't really understand where they are. And that's usually something that we need to work on. But one of the core things that we almost always work on first is cash flow forecasting because very, very, the most common thing is, you know, they, they can't sleep well at night because they don't know if they're going to make payroll next week, but maybe it's not next week, right? Maybe they know that in a couple months, it, it, there's a seasonality in the business, business is going to slow down, but they don't know if they have enough cash and they don't really... It, they just feel a little lost, right? Um, so we generally look at their goals. We look at what their pain points are. If they need, you know, to get organized, or if they just need to, you know, better define their goals. Um, and then we start to map out what are the key things that we need to do. What are the priorities that the client, you know, needs in order to get organized, right? Because it's sometimes we we want to just do everything at once, right? But the real, reality is that that's almost never practical, right? Bus restaurant owners are already busy enough, right? If you try to throw everything at once, it, it's not really going to end well. So we try to start with the very basics um, and, and start building on that. Rockstars, there are many elements to consider when growing your restaurant. Are you connecting with diners enough and with the right message? Could your kitchen be putting out more orders than your dining areas have room for? Well, it can be overwhelming, especially when the reason you got into this business is for the food and the people. That's why restaurants get Pop Menu. Pop Menu is the marketing tech platform designed to make growing your restaurant easy, so you don't have to grow it alone. 
With Pop Menu, you can capture more guests and their preferences through your restaurant's website that's designed to easily collect contact information and data so you can see what your guests love and why they dine with you. Connect and build authentic relationships with guests by using modern technology that personalizes marketing. Make all your systems work better together, improve margins, and conquer the chaos of your restaurant's digital presence. Pop Menu has a special offer for my listeners. For a limited time, get $100 off your first month plus lock in one unchanging monthly rate at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Go now to get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com slash rockstars. Hey there, rockstars. Let's talk birthday marketing. It's one of those critical, important details that either drive new and repeat business into your place or not. Now, very few of us are real expert marketers, but why not a program that's done for you, that targets all the customers in your area that are having birthdays? Everyone has a birthday. Why not speak to my buddy Dyson Barnett? He's a former restaurant owner operator. He knows this business, and now his company delivers birthday customers, and it's all done for you. Pick up the phone, contact my buddy Dyson, check out the link in this episode, and why not Get some marketing that you can track where you know exactly if it's working or not and what the return on investment is because so few marketing dollars that restaurant owners spend is trackable. So that's key. Dyson is pretty certain that he can get more butts in seats and not only more butts in seats, but repeat business. Once he introduces new customers to your restaurant, those people, if they have a great experience in your place, are going to come back and tell their friends. Now that's trackable and that's powerful marketing. Check it out at jointhebirthdayclub.com slash birthday rockstar. You know, you're, you're hitting an interesting point because in many cases, there are a lot of holes to plug in the dam that's leaking, right? And you just said you can't focus on everything at once. And these owners or even the GMs are focused on running the restaurant, really. You know, it's like serving the guests and putting out good food and putting out the fires that always happen that are unexpected. And this is sort of a backseat thing that is critically important and vitally important to their success or their future viability. Yet I'm still, you know, reacting to things. I'm not proactively planning for the future. And then suddenly you talk to them a couple of times and you see the big picture. And now we focus. Now we start here. So let's talk about that. You know, you, you mentioned cash flow forecasting. Is that always a priority? Because you're going to assess their cash flow position and make sure that they don't run out of cash by doing A, B, C, and D. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, it, it always comes back to that, at least from a starting point, or mm -hmm. almost always, because no business owner, restaurant owner, or any kind of business owner can make good decisions if they are really, if they're in a place of fear and if they're really uncomfortable about you know, where they are financially, mm -hmm. um, right. you end up naturally making bad decisions, right? You, Stress you, you, enters you... into this and now exactly. it's a desperation decision versus a, a strategic decision is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we can put it this way, right? A business can survive for a while without profit. I would say like profit is like food or cash is like water. You can survive some time without being very profitable, right? Within margins or with, you know, negative margins. Sometimes there's a down season, but if you have cash, you can survive. Now, when you don't have cash, you don't, you, there's not much time that you have. You, you're not going to survive very long, right? So it's critical to understand how cash flows in and flows out of the business. So that's one of the first things we want to do. And, you know, I was talking to this, um, this is a friend last last week and we were deep diving. Right. And, and I didn't have to go into a bunch of numbers, really, just based on what he knows about the business. We just it was literally just a conversation. And we were able to see that he just didn't have enough. He his cash has been dwindling. Right. His cash balance because he hasn't the business hasn't been doing well the past couple months. So the first thing we realized was, OK, first. If you want to have any time to make the adjustments you need to the business, you're going to need to find some cash, right? Get a loan, raise, you know, sell, sell something. Um, so we, we, we made a couple of decisions there. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, um, the second thing, the second decision we made was, okay, he had done really well last year. So he decided to invest in a couple different businesses. So while he had started with one core business, he now had three. 
But the other two were really just distractions. They weren't generating profit. In fact, they were generating a loss. One of them he had already given up on. The other one was just, was it was at a loss. And the core one uh, was the one he, that he was really good at and needed to focus on. So he said, you know, this, the thing we, you also need to do is you need to get rid of the distractions, right? We need to stop, get rid of the stuff that's not really generating results for you. Maybe it's sometime in the future you can go back to them, but right now you need to focus. And then we made that strategic decision, right? And then the third thing was, okay, if you've got some cash, right? First thing, you need to get some cash because you need, you need some breathing room or else you're not going to make good decisions and you need, you need to be able to focus. And it's hard to focus if you don't know if you're going to make payroll, right? All, every business owner has been in that position, right? And you don't sleep well at night. If you're not sleeping well at night, you're not waking up with the freshest mind. So you need to get yourself in that position. And then once you've got some cash, you've got rid of the distractions, then okay, let's have you focus on the business, focus on what you're good at. And then what I offered to him was, what we'll do to start is we're gonna set up a basic spreadsheet. It's, it's, that's all it is, just a, a spreadsheet where we're gonna put in all of the cash flow in and the cash flow out. We're gonna project it out you know, six weeks or six months, depending on, you know, the information we have. And you're going to be able to see looking forward how much cash you're going to have. And once we have that buffer, right, we're not going to get so much anxiety from looking at it because we know that even if it's unprofitable, you have some runway. But then we're going to focus on the turnaround in the business, focus on the things that you need to do. And we're going to, you know, get the ship in the right, in the right place. Fantastic. What are those things that progressively follow that strategic decision what mistakes were they making that you need to correct and what were you know what were some of the things you needed to do next to make this thing generate more cash to find some additional profitability to really dial in what they were doing because it sounds like things were pretty loose at that point so this client wasn't a restaurant right this client was actually a car dealer um mm -hmm. he's a friend of mine so but the same lessons apply yeah, so he was, lessons. Um, so he had his car dealership, but he was trying to do like wholesale, uh, buy wholesale and sell it back to wholesale as well. And, and I already had also bought um, a mechanic shop, right? Because last year was really good for him. I said, get rid of the mechanic shop, get rid of the, he's already not doing the wholesale thing because the car industry is not doing very well right now. Focus on your core. Your core is the car dealership, right? It's buying and selling used cars. Mm -hmm. You are the only person in the business that knows how to do this really well, which is find the cars that you know your clients are looking for and finding the clients, right? So focus on that. And once you have your finance stuff organized, you're gonna have the visibility to be able to you know, make the right decisions. The same kind of lessons apply to the restaurant industry, right? It, it's easy for you to get lost and try to do a million different things, expand your menu and have too many options, um, do too many, too many different things that you're not really good at. And you can, and you, and we all know this, right? But it's hard to be, to be disciplined about it is that if you as a restaurant, you know what you're really good at. And you know how to say no to the other shiny objects, to the other things that you could be doing, and you just focus on being really, really good at what you do. Um, that allows you to be more efficient, allows you to control your costs better, um, allows you to you know train your team and, and and set up better systems, better process. So figure out what it is for you that is your core. Focus as much as possible on that. And everything else, either eliminate it, automate it, or delegate it. And that's kind of the, 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 that's the general approach. Let's talk about the cost control piece, because that's pretty vital because restaurants can lose money really, really easily. You can lose money on the bar. You can lose money on your menu. I mean, all these things are happening. Your labor cost is the highest it's ever been right now. And margins are shrinking in this business. Our audience knows that. I mean, pre-pandemic, a lot of restaurants were on the verge of, you know, maybe 
10% net profit, maybe. And now it's, you know, the statistics are like somewhere between three to 5% for some, some are on the edge of going off the cliff. It's like margins in this business are really, really slim. So you need to obviously increase profit, control your costs, and really understand that foundational element of the business. And I'd say that that is pretty important. And I know that you you do that for your clients. Um, what are some of the ways that you help them with controlling costs? So the first and most important thing is understanding, right? Um, if you if you can't improve what you can't measure, right? It's like a, the Peter Drucker. Um, yeah, that's right phrase mm -hmm. so and i learned this a lot at burger king right they have they have everything is connected right they have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on these systems to be able to just connect everything and have visibility into everything nowadays right we don't have that level of sophistication but there are so many tools so much technology that allows you to pretty easily gather all of the data and be able to understand what's going on, right? So the first step is understanding, right? Uh, understanding your costs and, and deep diving. I would say it, it kind of depends on where you are in the journey, right? Like every restaurant owner has things they can improve. I, I'm going gonna, gonna to speak to that kind of person who doesn't really have uh, much in place at all kind of feels a little lost. I always okay. go back to cash first, okay. right? Mm -hmm. Because your reports, um, you know, your, your systems, they can, they can be misleading, but cash never lies, right? The, the bank, the bank balance never lies. Yep. So that's why I always like to start from there because if you have a basic spreadsheet where you have like by day, right? Your, your columns at the top are each day, you know, 30 days, right? We're looking forward. You have your sales, right? You can you can reasonably know or what to expect from sales, right? And then you have what your main suppliers are, and then you know for for food costs, and then your you know your other major expenses, payroll, you know your overhead costs. If you can look at that by day, this is something I suggest to people. If you can set up that spreadsheet, and, and we 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 share this for free, you know, a template for this. It's really simple, right? Um, but if you can do that every day and spend 10, 15, max 20 minutes, look at your bank feed. Look at what the cash that's coming in. Look at the cash that's going out. Put it on that spreadsheet. If you do that for 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, you're going to you're going to see and feel where your money is going and that's really powerful because even before you start going into the detail of costing out your recipes and all that kind of stuff it's really important for you to understand where cash is going that starts to give you a level of confidence and control that allows you to start diving deeper and seeing everything else but it starts with cash you know let's talk about inventory and prime costs and calculating those things. Do you see many of your clients are already doing these things? I know in, in my own experience, a lot of restaurants think inventory is figuring out what the order is that week versus what's the value of my goods on hand right now. And to me, that's always been like a restaurant, depending on its size, it's like leaving a thousand dollars, like in the walk-in all over the place for anyone to just see and take, you know, and there's your inventory, there's your value. And you're either efficiently ordering and efficiently managing that inventory and turning it over without spoilage and waste and theft, or you're losing money every single day. And those restaurants that do take physical inventory, they're taking it 30 days and they're waiting 30 days to find out, oh, my food cost just spiked 5%. And 30 days went by when I could have done it every single week until I stayed in what I call the sweet spot. I mean, this is a very basic system, but do you see restaurants doing this? Um, do you help them with that? I mean, is that part of it? And then calculating what the food and beverage and labor cost is on a weekly basis until they have that consistency and they're comfortable with it? So, so we set up systems. So when we start, we... We, we try to set up systems that will give you the visibility into what's going on, right? And be able to, to deep dive. Today, there are so many of the things that you can use that are built for restaurants that are not expensive, that allow you to have that visibility. And then we deep dive into it. For me, from Burger King, I saw how it works, right? With like the corporate stores, like they're doing daily counts for the key items. They're doing weekly 
uh, weekly and monthly, right? And all of that is in the system, like it's integrated, you see it, like you can, you can, mm -hmm. I remember the VP of company ops, I still have, I still talk to him, he's, he's my, still my mentor. He was super nerdy about this, right? He had this number called uh, V2I, variance to ideal, where like what the ideal cost, like in Burger King, they know what the ideal cost, cost of goods based on what they sold would be. And when it deviates from that, you know that that's either waste or uh, loss or something like that. Now, I wish I could tell you that all of my clients do inventory and all of my clients want to get into these details, but it's exactly what you're mentioning. Like I have, I have clients that are doing three, four, five million dollars a year in sales and they don't do inventory, right? They're just doing orders and doing all that stuff. And we have the systems in place, right? And I think one of the things that, you know, I've been doing this a couple of years, it's for me like the next step is trying to educate and convince these owners of the value of doing that is because I know just how much in dollars that means, right? That, that, that can make, that could be the difference between you doing a 5% margin and a 10% margin easily. Absolutely. You're here hitting a key, key point that I want the entire audience to hear and, and understand. I mean, if you could suddenly, I, I don't care if, I mean, okay, that's impressive. A lot of restaurant owners that are listening to this would love to be doing three to $5 million in sales. Okay. That's a decent size restaurant. And obviously they're doing well and all that kind of stuff. But if they're, if they don't have these systems in place, there's still a lot of leakage and breakage and waste and theft and all kinds of things are happening that they don't see that are adding up to hundreds of thousands of dollars and potentially lost profit against those millions in sales. And if you could just hit them over the head and say, listen, wouldn't you rather have an extra half a million bucks on the bottom line? If you just did ABC, wouldn't you be happier if you just put that in place and tracked and monitored it? And it's like, there's still a lot of restaurant owners out there that are in the trenches every day running the restaurant, but they're not running a business. And that's what I'm hearing you say right now. So how do we get through to them to really say, you know what, a little bit of homework on your part, working on the business now, not working in it, you know, training your people so well that they have your back so that you can literally focus on this one thing and what an impact it's going to it's going to make in your business. What could you do with an extra couple hundred grand that you could do for bonuses and incentivizing people and capital projects and improvements? And you could do immense things with that. I mean, yeah. you're speaking my language right now because <laughs> it's an eye opener. And I know a lot of restaurants would love to be in that position, one of having millions of sales, but even if they don't have millions of sales, they can find extra profit if they just focused on these fundamentals that we're talking about. No, absolutely. I mean, and that's the thing that when I left corporate, I said, I want to do this because I, I know how much power there is in these principles, these concepts, and you don't need to have million dollar systems to achieve it. It's, it's about daily routines. Mm -hmm. It's about habits, right? I think most people are intimidated because they've never had, they've never done it. Right. It's just, they don't know, they don't know what they don't know. Right. And they're afraid of that. And that's, that's completely understandable. Yes. I yes. think, I think convincing, rest yeah, I think convincing restaurant owners to, to, to do it is about, and this is kind of like a coaching thing or a sales, you know, sales kind of thing is you need to be able to show, you know, restaurant owners that them not making the decision to change is the difference between them achieving their goal and not achieving their goal. Right. It's the difference. It can be the difference between them, you know, sending their kids to college debt free or not. It can be the difference between them, you know, paying off their house in five to 10 years yes. or not. Right. Because it's that big of a difference. And, and then being able to, to take baby steps in the changes, right? Because in reality, if once you've done it, you know, it's not that complicated, right? You don't, you can make it complicated, but it doesn't need to be right. And then just, and just going step by step into getting the habits and the routines and the systems in place. Wow. You know what? There, there are crazy times right now following the pandemic that have continued from the pandemic. We're talking about inflation and food costs, the volatility of food costs, especially certain items that make it cost prohibitive for a restaurant that might have specialized 
in breakfast not so long ago to not be able to serve eggs because the price went through the roof and someone's not going to pay 30 bucks for an eggs benedict it's like this is the challenge that restaurants are facing and that's just one example so we've got inflation and rising prices but then we've got high labor costs and trying to attract a staff and keep a great staff and not be short staffed because in order to keep raising menu prices, the consumer has to keep getting value from what they pay for, but they also have to keep that service standard at a certain level. And the value proposition is kind of being lost because when we're you know, short staffed, the customer's waiting 45 minutes for their food and they're paying a premium to get it. And that's leading to poor online reviews. And it's just this spiral of stuff. You know, so somehow we need to head that off at the pass and 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 battle these rising costs that are out of control that we can't control, but we can control other things to counteract that. There are certain needle movers. What would you say to a client that says that's my biggest problem right now? Well, I think when you're looking at costs, uh, and you're starting off with understanding, right? Uh, if you have the the one of the things that I think is really cool nowadays is you have all of these different tools that allow you to, for example, you know, just take pictures of your invoices and upload them. Yeah, and then exactly. over time, they're, over time, they're gonna show you how the price has been uh, you know, evol evolving. And if you just look at that and look to understand, okay, what are the products that you buy the most of? What, are, what is the, you know, what costs you the most? What takes the most out of your, out of your top line? Highest um, volume purchase items. Like if you're a pizza place, you're buying cases and cases of cheese and pepperoni, right? Those are high volume purchases, but you're also talking about the most expensive items that you buy. Like if you're a steakhouse, obviously steaks and seafood and all that, all those high end proteins are costing you a lot of money. And these are the things that are obviously making a big impact on your profits and on rising costs. And it's like, these are some of the things you can look at, but I'm sure you have many more. Yeah, I mean, the, you start off with understanding those. What are those items, right? Like in a steakhouse, like what are the different cuts? How how have this? How's the evolution of price been on those on those specific cuts? And if you buy a lot of it, you really need to understand. Okay, if this has gone up twenty percent, I need to make an adjustment to my price, right? Or I need to you know change the product or shift something. Something needs to change, or else that that increase in price is just taking out of my bottom line. Yeah, right. you know, you also have, you know, restaurants have relationships. This is a business of relationships. And we work with certain suppliers. Maybe we absolutely love our food service rep, but these are super knowledgeable people. And I, I've not come across a lot of restaurants that routinely look at different items that they're buying, knowing that the company, if they're working with some of the larger suppliers, have multiple items that are very similar in quality but maybe they made a huge purchase of this versus that you're using that. And now just by asking, what are the alternatives? What can I, you know, the customer is not going to know the difference. The quality is the same. The taste profile is the same. Yet You bought like 30 million more cases of that. So I can get a lower price on it. Now, if you don't ask, you don't get, and always ask for a sample, say, okay, if, if I've got options, let me taste it and let me see if I like the product. And if I do think of how that moves the needle on, on food cost across multiple items on a menu. I mean, that's just one example. I'm sure you see that too. Yeah. And there are many yeah, more examples of that. I mean, this is one example of cost controls that we're talking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, no, do going out and, and always going to the market and seeing what's out there, what the options are. You, you need to constantly be, it, it's, a, it's a constant process, right? Of understanding where you're at, and just probing and deep diving and understanding what are your costs? What are your biggest cost items? Are there other options? What are the, what always evaluating what your options are. That is just the most fundamental thing. If you have that curiosity to understand where you're at, understand your costs, understand what the options are, that will naturally lead you to making the decisions that you need to adjust. Like if, if you're, if you're a restaurant owner that you all, you have the same supplier, and you look at the cost of a of specific products, you know, maybe once every couple months, you know, or once a year, and you're just buying from that. That's not, you know, usually restaurants look more often, maybe once a month. But mm -hmm. if you're being very systematic about looking at that regularly and, and going into the detail, you know, once you look at the options and you just keep your options open and are constantly evaluating, that will naturally lead you to say, hey, you know, I spend, you know, 10% of my, of my revenue on steak, 
right? And and this steak, you know, has a has a similar similar um, similar product to this other supplier, and they're going to be able to give me a cost five percent cheaper. That can make a big difference on your bottom line, right? If That's you're not true. compromising quality, if you're not compromising any of that, just looking to understand that will will take you a, a very long way. And, and it's with restaurants because it's thin margins. It's all about the incremental changes. It's not there's not going to be one major thing that you do that's going to transform the business. Sometimes, sometimes you know, there's a big decision that you can make that will make a you know, but it's most often it's the small things, right? It's understanding the details and, and knowing what those details are and playing with them and making small changes. That's how you get a restaurant from 5% margin to 10% margin or from 10 to 15 and so on and so forth. How much um, do you see restaurants costing out their menu items and keeping up with that as the market for goods is changing? Knowing, but it's one thing to actually go through the process of costing out everything so you know what it costs you, labor not included, just ingredient costs versus the price you charge the customer for an item. And you got all the categories. You got appetizers, entrees, soups, salads, burgers, desserts. It goes on and on and on. And depending on the complexity of your restaurant, of course, but are you seeing that happening much? And and even if they do have recent and cost sheets are they using that data because that to me is a, is a big needle mover i i see restaurant owners do that costing when they start you know they, they bring a new recipe recipe yeah. but i i rarely see them systematically updating it and looking at it and reviewing it and i think that's where the problem is because it's very easy for you to have in your mind this cost from a while ago and you kind of know, oh, you know, you know, the cost of this has gone up, but it's much more powerful when you actually go back to that recipe and say, okay, now what is this now? And that makes you, you know, that's in your face and that makes you realize, oh, this, you know, this doesn't make me money anymore. And then you, you realize that a change needs to be made. But I think restaurant owners don't do that often enough. I agree. I mean, they could be selling items that are actually losing money right now. And based on the popularity of those items, they're spinning their wheels. Okay, I've got a busy restaurant and I'm filling my seats, but my bank account isn't growing. What's wrong? And you probably yeah. see that really, really often. But I guess the point I'm making is uh, there's so many menus that are designed for variety and appeal to the guest, and they've got lots of choices that their customers seem to enjoy. Like the menu mix seems to be working, yet the profits are all over the place. And the spread, the profit spread in each category is many, many dollars. And if this is more popular than that, and it's lower in profit to the bottom line, then there's where you're spinning your wheels, you know? And if you're not, if you're not aware of these, like you said, the, the the minor shifts or the focuses on what you could be doing. Again, we're leaving lots and lots of money on the table at the end of every year if we can't tighten up that menu to also be more profitable than it is now. Okay, we got the we got the variety and the appeal, the customer, they like the menu, but there's a real delicate balance of tightening that spread so that, okay, maybe a difference is 80 or 90 cents here or there, but when I'm losing three bucks every time this appetizer sells versus that appetizer, it's like I'm paying the highest wages to the kitchen to make anything and everything, yet I'm actually losing potential profit because these are huge sellers. And if they are huge sellers and they're not that profitable, that tells you the market will bear a price increase on that item because my customers love it, you know, and they understand that inflation is happening. This is just one example, you know, that I see with some clients that I work with and, you know, wow, this is just one idea. And there's so many little changes they can make, like you say, that all of a sudden you add all those things up and suddenly there's a big impact to that net profit and, and it rises many, many, many points. But again, you can't do this if you're working in your business versus working on it and understanding what some of these changes could be and then dedicating time every week. Like you said, that spreadsheet where I'm tracking for 30 days and I'm getting a, a real feel for my business and the cash flowing in and the cash flowing out. I mean, prime importance to focus in on this if you want to stay in business and even more so stay successful and be more successful. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, it's um. Go ahead. 
Yeah. Let's talk about a short-term strategy and then a long-term strategy. Do you continue to work with clients for a long period of time? Do you have long-term relationships or do you jump in and you help them put these changes in place and then you kind of move on? I mean, do you have a team of people that work with you or are you focused in on being selective in your process with your clients and how much time do you spend with each one? We're generally looking for long-term relationships with clients. Um, we work on a fixed fee. Like we, we, we do projects, right? Especially when we're taking on a client, we'll look at what their specific need is now, right? And, and, and figure out a project to kind of get things under control and get things on the right track. And then look to have like a, a fixed fee going forward so that we'll, we'll act as that advisor moving forward and help keep the owner on track to their goals. That's the end goal, right? Uh, that we're at, whereas that outside advisor that has, that understands the numbers that's in there and helps to bring clarity. At the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring clarity to the business owner so that it's easy for him to set him or her to set priorities and, and then they can shine, right? I think most people, when they focus and then they have, are, are in the position to be able to focus, they do well. Right. So what we we do have a team. Right. I am the main um, fractional CFO. Right. So I, I work the most with business owners on like the strategy side and that kind of thing. But we started out, uh, say, the first <clears throat> two years, two and a half years, building out a team as well for more of the operational side. Right. Helping with bookkeeping, helping with keeping the cash flow up to date, all that kind of stuff. And for example, you know, obviously I started with my dad's restaurant first and I use that as a pilot and yeah. I reverse engineered all of the systems that he had. We figured out a way to put it all in the cloud, have it all online um, so that anyone could access it. Right. And then we have a team and we manage all of that. And the end goal of, of getting all of that stuff in place uh, was really just for me to be able to have the data and have good, clean, quality data to be able to sit down with the owner and say, look, this is where you're at. Now, what are your goals and how do we get from here to here, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And that's a forever process, right? No one's ever, well, no one's ever really satisfied with where they are. Either they're trying to grow their business, you know, grow sales, grow their bottom line, have more locations, or maybe they're already happy with where they are. They have a good, successful business. But they need to have an exit strategy, right? And, and maybe that exit strategy, it involves the advisor with what they need to do to sell. But we'll, we'll be there to help with actually going through the steps, right? What are the processes? What are the systems? And what are the things that you need in order to get to where you want to go? Well, you have a genuine love for this business. And I get the sense that you really have a passion for helping others succeed. And yes, you're running a business and yes, you're making money, but it's really about the satisfaction you're getting from helping someone transform their business. And a lot of business owners, restaurant owners or not, look at things as a cost and not an investment. But once you build that trust and you show them that you can help them improve their business and that there's going to be a return on that investment, then that leads to a long-term relationship because that trust, you know, you're the first one that they pick up the phone and say, hey, I got a new idea. What do you think of this? And it's like that that builds a really beautiful relationship into the future. And I'm sure... I don't want to speak for you, but I'm sure that's how you develop your client base. And then there's the referrals, of course. Oh, you should talk to my friend Jonathan because look what he did for my business and he can do the same for your business. But again, I just want to emphasize that you got to be an opportunist in this business. And that means keeping your eyes open for something that extraordinary that can really change and, and transform what you're doing. And I know in this business, the phone rings off the hook all day and people are constantly showing up at the back door with no appointments. And it's like, I want to sell you this and I want to sell you that. And it's often hard to not shut those people out when just one of those could be something huge. But don't look at things as a cost. Look at them as an investment and always keep your eyes open for opportunity. And I think I think you'd agree with that approach. Um, Jonathan, let me ask you, uh, was your dad really, really receptive to you like coming in and like 
implementing all this knowledge and all this expertise and everything you learned in the corporate world and even in working with your current clients. I mean, what was his thought process after being so close to his business for decades and running it a certain way? And now the young buck is coming in and he's going to turn things upside down, but he says it's going to be better. Did he have that trust? Did he embrace you? Well, I think my dad, um, you know, I have to give him so much credit because, you know, obviously he's always been my biggest fan and he's always given me all the support. Right. Um, but yeah, he, he, I think he, I think the thing that he always recognized was that I have a very different mind brain than he does. Like he's a very, he's a huge relationships guy. He has a natural business savvy, right? He, he, and I think a lot of restaurant owners intuitively understand the concepts of, you know, pricing and costing and, and the different, you know, with experience, you gain these things, but getting down into the details of the numbers is a niche, right? It's, it's an Achilles heel for a lot of people. A lot of people don't, they aren't nerdy, right? They don't love spreadsheets. I love spreadsheets. I mean, that's the reality of it. I do too. I mean, you're right. I mean, a lot of people are intimidated by numbers because they, they think they don't understand them. Or I was always terrible at math in school and they just avoid it when it is or can be simpler than they actually think. And I think you can sort of shift that mindset with your clients to get them really excited about the numbers, especially when you can show them how the numbers can improve the business. And once they start seeing that, maybe you see them diving in a little deeper, getting really excited. About, okay, what's next? I liked what we just did. What, what are we going to do now? You know, that's a mindset shift. And we got to forget about our old habits and, and ways of thinking. And then once you can prove to them that something works, then I think, you know, the the openness to those new ideas suddenly comes out. And and I think you're talking about your dad. I mean, you showed him a lot of cool stuff, and I think he's really excited. One, he's your biggest fan. And wow, what a great relationship you must have. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like um, when it comes to restaurant owners in general, the way I approach starting relationships with clients is, is very similar to how a good restaurant owner, you know, deals with, with customers, right? It, it starts with the relationship. If you want the business to go far, you need to invest up front, right? And lead with the value, you know, uh, touch the tables, talk to the, talk to customers, get their feedback, you know, you know, give them, give them a, something to, on their first visit, give them a dessert or something to, you know, to make them happy, just oh, exceed their expectations, build that goodwill. Right. And for me, it's the same thing, right. It's about, as I mentioned with this uh, friend last week, you know, he said, I need you to come over and, and help me with this thing. I spent two and a half hours with him. I didn't charge him anything for that consultation. Right. And and getting, just helping him get clarity, leading with value, being there to serve. You know, the next, the next morning he sent me a text and he said, I mean, you're, 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 you're a blessing. You, I woke up with a different level of energy. Like awesome. who in the restaurant business or in any business, who doesn't like, who doesn't feel happy about doing what you're doing? You get, when you get that kind of message or get feedback from a, from a, you know, a customer in your restaurant. So it's, it's all at the end of the day, it's about serving first and, and the value and, you know, success will, will come after that. That's a great approach to, to business in general. So you have certain clients that you've worked with a long, long time. Are you noticing that, you know, this is a business of referrals? And obviously I'm, I'm really impressed with everything we've talked about today. And we're going to put your contact information in our show notes and people will know how to reach out to you, but your clients in general, they vary in size of, is there a certain level of client that you will work with or, or starting point, or you love mom and pops or regional chains, or I've got three locations or five, does it matter to you? Or is there a specialty? So we, we generally now work with businesses. I would say the sweet spot is between like in revenue, like a million a year and 10 million a year. Like if they're more than 10 million a year, they're already getting big, they, we can still work with them, but pretty soon they're kind of outgrowing us. Um, right. They're, you know, once you've got a business with many, many locations, they're going to hire their own, you know, full-time CFO, right. That's probably what they should do. The very small, like the smaller restaurants, right. Under million, under 500 K 
we work with them as well. Um, and, and we're trying to figure out a different way. Like I've been doing a lot of like this direct CFO work, but sometimes a lot of value can be added just by coaching them, right? And having like a, a monthly call that, you know, we can provide some direction. And, and we're working on different ways of adding value to those to those kind of clients as well. Uh, but I'd say our sweet spot is between that one and 10 million in revenue a year. That's fantastic. Well, I've enjoyed our conversation so much and you've added a tremendous amount of value. And again, talking about these basic systems and making subtle shifts in your business and then working with an expert that can open your eyes to new opportunities, I think is just smart. So it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast, Jonathan. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Roger. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay, audience, thanks again for tuning in. That was the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. We can't wait to see you in the next episode. So please stay tuned and stay well. Wow, Jonathan, thank you so much. What a great episode. You and I are talking shop, and this is definitely a place very close to my heart. And being really close to your finances, really understanding what your critical numbers are is so important when you run a restaurant. And again, systemizing your business and working on it now versus in it and having your staff have your back so you can spend you know, quality focused attention on your numbers is, is so vital to your future success. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for sharing your expertise. And I think you inspired all of us to work on our business. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. Thank you so much to our sponsors. We hope everyone stays well and we can't wait to see you next time. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.